Today we're talking about another designer of a car that's in this museum. A car that uh, is so amazing in design that I can hardly ever walk by it without stopping and admiring it. And that ca car is the 1936 Cordy 10, designed by Gordon Burig. So today we're going to take a look at the life of Gordon Burig and his uh, work on the Cord automobile. Burig said, I have little talent in art. I can't sing, I can't dance, and I play a lousy game of golf. But to me, autos are a work of art, and I consider myself an artist in that respect. I'm a sculptor of car bodies. Gordon Bjerg was born in Mason City, Illinois in 1904. Mason City is about 45 miles south of Peoria, a very small community, but big enough to have a bank where his father worked as a cashier. He attended public schools, and he had uh, one brother. After graduating from high school in 1922, he uh, attends Bradley Polytechnic uh, in Peoria, Illinois, that now today is Bradley University. <clears throat> At a very early age, he was very interested in automobiles, and interesting enough, his family never owned an automobile during his uh, formative years. <clears throat> but he loved to uh, draw automobiles, and when he gets to uh, the uh, Bradley uh, Polytechnic uh, Facility, he's taking a chem chemistry class, and he actually gets, gets expelled from that class because uh, he was drawing uh, automobiles in his notebook. Uh, for those that remember uh, the talk I gave on Virgil Exeter, uh, same thing happened to him in high school. He uh, uh, got in trouble for drawing in his notebook, drawing automobiles. His first design car was... Uh, <clears throat> something he did with his brother. Uh, they purchased what was left of a 1904 Orient buckboard and uh, they built a uh, body uh, on it, uh, mainly out of wood. In 1923, he uh, went off to Chicago to drive a cab. Uh, <clears throat> he needed to earn some money and uh, this was a great way to look at automobiles in the large city. And while doing that, he decides uh, one day that he would stop at the firm of C.P. Kimball Company. And uh, he meets a designer there by the name of Clarence Wexelberg. And Wexelberg would become his mentor. And uh, he asked him uh, what he needed to do to be a car designer. Wexelberg advises him to return to Bradley and to study drafting, metal shop, and art. So he does that. The following year, he uh, is able to get employment in November of 1924 with the Godfredson Body Company in Wayne, Michigan. This was a, a pretty large uh, company. They uh, built bodies uh, for uh, Peerless, uh, Will Sinclair, and Jewett Automobiles. And his work there mainly was uh, uh, like an apprentice, but he got to learn a lot about uh, bodybuilding and construction. <clears throat> he then moved on to um, uh, the Dietrich Company, bodybuilder, who uh, built bodies uh, for Franklin Packard and uh, Lincoln, and he kind of did the same thing there, more uh, apprentice-type work. <clears throat> but in January of the next year, uh, he was hired um, <clears throat> by Packard, and at Packard, he actually got to draw some uh, body uh, pan panels. Uh, didn't stay there very long, for later that year, he was hired by Harley Earl, 
uh, at General Motors. Now this was his first job uh, as a designer. And uh, he was uh, an employee of Harley Earl in the new Department of Art and Color that was established by GM. His first production uh, design was a dashboard for the 1939 Buick. He then moved on to the Stutz Motor Company. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this was a company that had very limited uh, financial resources at the time. Uh, but he was able to design a race car by a Black Hawk. And uh, he designed a dashboard for one of the cars and uh, some minor changes on production automobiles for the company. In June of 1929, he was hired by Duesenberg. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, a little shy of his 26th birthday, so he's 25 years old. He was uh, hired uh, to be the only designer uh, at Duesenberg. And he would be uh, just the only one for the next three years. <clears throat> now, Duesenberg, of course, uh, prior to his arrival, uh, made the beautiful uh, uh, L29 front-wheel drive car. And, uh, of course, they were in production of a Model J Duesenberg that had been designed by um, Harold Ames. Uh, E.L. Cord and Fred Duesenberg. Uh, the job uh, didn't pay very much, and uh, he ends up uh, residing with Fred uh, uh, Duesenberg. Actually, he uh, rented a room in his house and lived there for about three years. Vieri uh, gloved the design of the Duesenberg Model J, had no desire to make any changes on it, but he was, uh, on occasion, uh, asked to do some minor changes on uh, cars that had special requests by the uh, uh, customer. Upon his arrival, he was asked to design the hood ornament for the Duesenberg. Uh, they uh, did not have a lot of money for tooling, and so he made a very uh, interesting design and you can uh, see that on the Duesenberg that we have in uh, Gallery 3. He ends up designing a uh, special uh, body for uh, Judkins um, uh, Duesenberg uh, called the Sheriff Archer Judkins Coupe. And this was a uh, two-seater car, which, of course, with that wheelbase, made it a very uh, long, stretched-out vehicle. Interesting design. He designs a, uh, another car for Judkins that uh, is called the Victoria Coupe. And uh, this car is really unique because it has a regular seat for the driver and can sit two people in the back seat. And the passenger seat in the front is actually a jump seat. So uh, this car uh, is somewhat of a modified Berlin style where it can be owner driven or driven by a uh, chauffeur. He also designs the uh, uh, Berlin uh, sedan. Uh, Berlin model, for those that may not know exactly what it is, is basically a car that is designed to be driven by the owner or uh, it has a uh, <clears throat> divider in it that can be put in place so that it can be driven by a chauffeur. He's then asked to design a uh, car for the 1933 New York World's Fair. And he designs a car called the Arlington, uh, later uh, more prominently known as the 20 grand, which reflects the price uh, of the car. Had very interesting styling, uh, including uh, external hinges uh, that you can see uh, on the doors, uh, padded top as well. 
He designs the uh, Wattel Sportster, as it's uh, known today. Uh, this is a car that uh, is owned uh, <clears throat> by folks that are in this uh, community, and therefore this car has been on a special display at this museum uh, several times. One of his favorite designs at Duesenberg was the uh, Torster. Uh, this is a uh, four-door Phaeton type of vehicle, and uh, <clears throat> to him it looked attractive with a top up or the top down. It had a very uh, good look to it. In 1933, things were slow at Duesenberg, so he uh, returns to General Motors. And uh, when he arrives there, uh, the uh, uh, Harley Earl um, <clears throat> Department of Art and Color uh, had a number of designers, and things are kind of slow. So Harley Earl decides to have a contest, and he puts the designers in small groups uh, to design a four-door sedan. As it turns out, Burig's group came in last place. About that time, he was contacted by Harold Ames at Duesenberg, who wanted uh, Burig to come back and design a baby Duesenberg. <clears throat> so uh, he did that. So he was back at Duesenberg, and uh, he takes with him um, some of the designs that he had worked on uh, at GM. And basically, uh, one of those designs became the prototype of the baby Duesenberg. <clears throat> and uh, it has some resemblance, we'll see, uh, to the Cord 810. But unfortunately, at the time, uh, the Auburn cars uh, were not selling very well. Uh, there was uh, a lot of criticism about the uh, grill design. And so they put Bjerg on the project of redesigning the grill on the Auburn. He was given only $50,000 uh, to do this, a very modest amount of money uh, to make a quick uh, change on the style of the car. Uh, this is the 34 Auburn. You see it has the lower uh, grill uh, panels at the uh, <clears throat> lower uh, front of the car. And uh, he takes that <clears throat> and makes a very different looking uh, style on the car, uh, much more uh, aesthetic. In addition, he took off the large V that went across the hood of the car. And uh, he also... Uh, changed the boat tail <clears throat> rear end of the 851 uh, Speedster. The baby Duesenberg uh, idea was dropped, and the uh, <clears throat> directors uh, at CORE decided that uh, they would go uh, with a CORE automobile that would have a V8 engine and front wheel drive. So that Cord 810 is born. They studied the Cord L29, and uh, one of the problems with that car was that uh, uh, it had trouble at times getting traction on the front wheels. Uh, and so on the Cord 810, they moved the transmission uh, further forward to have a, more weight uh, on the front wheels. Uh, the initial design of the Cord 810 had the uh, headlights uh, in the inner fenders, and they would pop out into the area between the fenders and the hood. And after they built a couple of prototypes, they moved the headlights to the front of the fender. And they come out with the Cord uh, 810 for production, getting ready to go with it. Burig at this time gets married. Uh, he gets married uh, in December of 1934. Uh, he goes on his honeymoon uh, down to Florida. And uh, when he comes back in January, he finds that the Cord project had been placed on hold by the board of directors of the company. 
he was pretty discouraged with that, uh, as a lot of people were in the company, because they were pretty excited about this new car. And it remained on hold until July, when the directors changed their uh, mind and decided to go ahead with production of the car. In addition to making that decision, they decided that the car should be presented at the New York Auto Show in November. That was only four months away. Um, <clears throat> the requirements for that show uh, were that you had to have 100 cars produced to have it in the show. Uh, they later got an exception on that and it ended up with 11 cars at the time the show began. But it certainly made things very rushed and uh, the workers there and Brewig and others were uh, working uh, practically uh, uh, seven days a week to get that uh, car available, a uh, number of cars available for the show. They were presented at the show and uh, were a hit. Uh, so much of a hit that uh, other car manufacturers who had exhibits around them uh, were very annoyed because people would come and stand on the running boards of their cars to take a look at these new cords. So what did people see when they saw the Cord 810 at that uh, show? Well, first of all, you have to kind of remember what cars look like outside before they entered the car show. Uh, square, black, and boxy, most of them. And they go in and they see this car that is uh, uh, quite outstanding. Uh, first thing you notice, of course, is the hidden headlights. Uh, it has a front wheel drive. It has a uh, Lycoming V8 engine in it. It has a four-speed pre-select transmission. It has unit body construction. It has a U-shaped uh, subframe in the front. And uh, on the back of the uh, car, uh, it has uh, two large uh, taillights. a bracket that holds the license plate that has a light in it. And the car has pontoon style front fenders. This was something that Brewig uh, uh, had made drawings of in some uh, previous cars he was trying to design. And he always had the idea that uh, the pontoon fenders uh, would be on a car and be able to turn with the front wheels. And we'll talk about that uh, again later. On the Cord A10, uh, attention to detail, nice subtle uh, detail work on a car. Uh, the uh, dashboard is uh, uh, quite attractive. You have a uh, radio speaker above the windshield. And um, for the steering wheel, the Cord Company was running out of money and decided to go to a supplier and buy a off-the-shelf steering wheel. Well, Brewerig designed a horn ring and uh, was able to make the uh, steering wheel look more attractive and certainly compatible with the design of the car. He did the same thing with the uh, interior doorknobs. Uh, door handles were uh, uh, off the shelf uh, purchased and uh, he made them uh, look different by making a large uh, knob uh, that was color uh, contrasted with the color of the car. Interesting enough on the sedans, uh, the uh, windows <clears throat> on the uh, front door, uh, side door, uh, uh, driver's door I should say, uh, is uh, interchangeable with the one on the back door on the opposite side of the car. This certainly made a uh, reduction in the tooling costs uh, of uh, building those uh, <clears throat> designs on the doors, window design. Uh, hubcaps were used, not necessarily the first car, but one of the first to have uh, full wheel hubcaps. 
on uh, early prototypes, they found that the uh, brakes overheated because the air was cut off uh, to the uh, brakes. So they uh, made the hubcaps uh, with these uh, holes in them, which made them kind of uh, unique. On the 812, um, and of course, they had the supercharged uh, engine. Uh, took uh, that uh, <clears throat> Lycoming engine up to 170 horsepower. And uh, they had external uh, exhaust on the car. And interestingly enough, uh, these were designed with the assistance of uh, Alex Tremolis, who was later the designer of the Tucker. On the back of the car, uh, the 812 sedan, uh, they uh, had more of a, a bustle look to it to uh, make a little larger uh, trunk. Um, utility uh, superseded style uh, by doing that. The numbers uh, built, well, uh, 1,622 810s, uh, 1,278 812s. There were a lot of problems with the car, unfortunately. A very attractive car, but because of the rush to get it in production, they had problems with the transmission. <clears throat> they had some quality problems. And uh, the word kind of got out uh, that it was not a, a good, reliable car. Uh, during this competitive time uh, in the pr Depression years, uh, that was not a good thing to have happen. So in 1937, uh, Cord decides to stop uh, automobile production. The body uh, dies were sold off. And interesting enough, they uh, appeared, uh, minus the hidden headlights, uh, with the uh, Hup uh, Skylark and the Graham Hollywood. Uh, Hupp made about uh, 350 of these cars. Graham made about uh, 1,800. So what did Brewery do at that point? Well, he goes to work for the Bud uh, Manufacturing Company that made uh, bodies for many uh, uh, various uh, companies. Uh, and uh, his first task was to, to design a design studio for the company. And then he designed a small car that was kind of a miniature cord uh, that was a VW uh, type uh, car. Bud could not sell that to any of the major manufacturers and therefore that car was never uh, produced. Nineteen forty, Brewig moves on to uh, San Diego, California to work with the Consolidated Aircraft Company. And he remained working there uh, for uh, over five years. Uh, worked on aircraft components, uh, designing them uh, during the war years. In 1946, he's hired by uh, Raymond Lowy to head the Lowy studio at Studebaker. This was an interesting situation because when he went there, one of the employees of Lowy was Virgil Exner. Exter was a, a friend and a, a fellow uh, designer. And uh, Bierig finds himself the boss of his uh, friend for a while. But as it turns out, um, Exner is fired by uh, Raymond Lowy because he was working, for, uh, uh, working on some uh, plans at home uh, outside of the, the Lowy studio, and uh, he was immediately hired by Studebaker. Uh, so for a while, uh, Exner and Burek had kind of parallel positions uh, working for two different uh, people doing the same job. His influence obviously uh, was present in the design of the 1950 and 51 uh, Studebakers with the uh, kind of an aircraft uh, front end style and uh, kind of protruding fenders as well. 
He then moves on to the uh, Tasco, uh, the American sports car company. He was an investor in it, as along with uh, uh, many other people. And the idea was to design a, uh, a streamlined sports car. He designs the car, and one prototype was built. Now, this car had the pontoon fenders in the front that turned with the wheels. So he finally got to uh, design that. Another look at the car. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure where that car is today. I know it was at the Peterson Museum at uh, uh, one time, but I'm not sure uh, uh, where it is, but it still it exists. But this was the only car built. Uh, financially, he loses money as well as the other investors. In 1951, the New York Museum of Modern Art displayed an exhibit of his work called Rolling Sculpture, uh, quite an accomplishment for an automobile designer to be acknowledged in that way. On the uh, Tasco sports car, uh, he designs some removable panels on the top, making it a T-top design. In 1951, he uh, acquired a patent for that design. He went around to all the major car companies and uh, Mercedes as well, and could not get anyone to show any interest in building a car with a T-top roof. In the fall of 1967, he opens up a magazine and he sees a picture of the new Corvette with a T-top roof. So needless to say, he hires an attorney and he proceeds to uh, sue General Motors for infringement on his patent. Uh, they came to him and made a settlement of an undisclosed amount of money. Uh, so the T-top, of course, was used on a number of cars after that. In 1949, he goes to work for the Ford Motor Company, and he worked there until 1965. His first project there was to design a hardtop uh, convertible uh, style vehicle on the 51 Ford. Uh, Ford was uh, behind uh, Chrysler and General Motors in developing a hardtop convertible style uh, model. And uh, they wanted to put it on the 51, but they were redesigning the Ford for 52. So they didn't want to spend a lot of money on this project. So again, uh, Burig is in a situation where he has to design something uh, <clears throat> and keep the costs uh, down to uh, a minimal amount. Uh, so he designs the uh, Victoria hardtop which was well received by the public. And it, of course, uh, had a three-piece rear window style to it. His next project at Ford was to design the 1952 uh, station wagon models. And uh, they were very good looking cars as well. Then he's asked to work on a special car that Ford was going to build. That was going to be a very, very uh, expensive car, high quality car, and to be a rival uh, against some uh, such cars as a Rolls Royce. And that was the Continental. Uh, he is credited at various places uh, that I've read uh, <clears throat> to be the designer of the car. He was not the designer. Uh, that was a man by the name of John uh, Reinhardt. But uh, Brewerig was the uh, construction engineer of this car. Uh, he figured out how uh, to build it and, and uh, <clears throat> keep up the very high quality the car had. And of course, this is a car that uh, uh, never financially uh, panned out for Ford, but it certainly uh, made them known uh, for their very uh, good ability do you have a high quality luxury car? Another look at the Continental. 
His last five years at Ford were kind of interesting because he really wasn't designing cars as much as he was involved in uh, structural engineering concerning uh, fiberglass and plastics. So uh, that tells us that uh, Ford was looking at fiberglass. Uh, it may be uh, inspired by the uh, success of the Corvette, uh, but of course they never uh, got anything into production. <clears throat> so he retires, 1965, and then for the next five years, he, he uh, works at the College uh, of Art, or the Art Center of Design in uh, Los Angeles, something that he enjoyed doing uh, uh, immensely. He was inducted in the Hall of Fame, Automotive Hall of Fame, in uh, 1989. And... Uh, the following year, uh, he died at the age of 85. He's buried in, uh, in Auburn, Indiana, and his headstone reads, Master Designer. Gordon Breurig. For those who want more information about him, I would suggest uh, the book that he wrote, 1975, uh, called uh, Rolling Sculpture, and uh, the book was reprinted by Auburn Court Museum uh, in uh, 2008. And then uh, there's a great extensive article at uh, coachbuilt.com uh, uh, concerning a lot of the uh, technical information about his design work. Thank you very much. <laughs>